Openjaw is on location at the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel. And this is the view we have on a gorgeous sunny day. Snow peaks, I mean, oh my God, Canada is so beautiful. Uh, we're here because WestJet is holding their key client event and they've invited Openjaw to participate in some of the sessions and to moderate uh, their forum. So it's a great couple of days that we're looking forward to and we'll bring you a lot of the news that is being imparted to the guest agents who are here. John, I have to say I have thoroughly enjoyed the last couple of days here with you at uh, the Banff Springs Hotel and your presentations uh, are quite enlightening in the way that you talk about WestJet's growth strategy and the way you talk about what's involved in achieving those goals is to me fascinating. And in that vein, one of the things that I want to ask you that I f I'm really kind of curious about, because it's sort of like an intangible that I sensed in all of the WestJet team um, that is here, is almost like a sense of Duty is not a good word because it sounds like a heavy thing, but almost like um, a sense of commitment to the marketplace to be a carrier that is, you know, a legitimate competitor and stand on its stands on its own, you know, and is, holds its head up high and offers product um, that is a a variation on sort of the status quo. I'm trying to use um, politically correct words here, but it's almost like it's, it's a sense of vocation and maybe I'm going too far with that. How, yeah. how would you respond? Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you, uh, Nina, for being here with us uh, up, up in Banff. It's been a great couple of days and I really appreciate your support and support from everyone that we had up here. Uh, so it's nice to be chatting with you today. It's not a pink couch, but it's a nice, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice venue anyway. Um, you know, it's interesting that you picked up on, on that and that comment. I, I think we would support it quite a bit. We do feel, I feel, I think everyone at WestJet, we feel a responsibility. And we feel that we have a responsibility to connect Canadians. It's part of the, the reality of the country that we live in. It's a massive geography. Uh, air, air travel is an essential service in this country. And if, if it weren't for airlines, uh, you know, a place like Banff, a place like Calgary, it would be really, really difficult to get to. And, um, and we know there's a lot of Canadians across the country who need to travel for work. They need to travel to visit friends and family. Uh, or they need to travel to get away on a leisure vacation and enjoy their enjoy time with loved ones and and we feel we have a real responsibility to uh, to provide that type of service and we feel that we have a responsibility to provide that type of service for all segments of the market for all Canadians and uh, whether that's the ultra price conscious um, uh, traveler all the way up to a corporate traveler who needs uh, who needs the frequency and convenience to travel for business we want to be able to provide that service so we really do feel uh, a sense of responsibility in that in, in terms of your strategy People, I think, are under the impression that WestJet has sort of pulled back into the Western market, but you are flying a lot out of the East. Mm -hmm. And um, however, out of Calgary, you have, I think, 88 routes, I believe, is, is what the number that was uh, presented. So where are you seeing the growth? Where will it happen across the country? And how will you execute on that, especially considering aircraft are an issue? That's a big question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. So you kind of referenced the, the strategy. The strategy has three important pillars. So um, the first is to win in the West and to grow where we believe we can win, which is uh, Western Canada. We have a, a lot of advantages here that I can speak to. Uh, the second is to lead in the leisure segment of the market, and that's from across the country, whether it's Western Canada, Eastern Canada, uh, taking Canadians down to Mexico, the Caribbean, and Southern United States in the wintertime to escape the the, the winters that we have here, or whether it's for um, you know seasonal leisure service across the Atlantic, we want to be present in those markets, and we want to connect Canadians from east to west. And we've uh, we've invested quite a bit in doing that. We just announced last week new nonstop service between Calgary and Fredericton, New Brunswick. For the first time, we're going to be flying that route, and um, that is the 35th nonstop route that we operate across the country between Western Canada and Eastern Canada. So we really do take our uh, our responsibility seriously to connect Canadians, and that's uh, that's a big part of our strategy going forward. The third pillar, so winning in the West, we, uh, I made a comment earlier today, uh, we are the largest airline measured by departing seats, nonstop routes, departures, and so forth. We're the largest airline in seven of the eight biggest cities in Western Canada, so we are the largest carrier out West, and we're also the largest carrier in seven of the eight biggest destination markets in Mexico and the Caribbean. And so we feel that those uh, those two advantages give us a great platform to be able to grow from. We do intend to grow. Our strategy is about growth and accelerating our growth. And a part of that is keeping our costs low to make sure that we can provide affordable service for Canadians in the years to come. Yeah. 
Um, you, you talked about the challenges uh, that are in the marketplace, and um, ULCCs are certain one of, and it's difficult, as uh, Alexis has said. I'm going to call him Alexis because I don't want to trip over the last name. <laughs> yeah, the two of us, yeah. <laughs> um, had presented um, in Toronto very you know, eloquently that uh, fees and, you know, large country, small population presents so many issues for carriers to maintain profitability. And it, it's an issue for even a ULCC like Swoop, which has been integrated um, into the main line. But you talked about something so interesting. You talked about the difference in the market itself and that a ULCC's purpose, which I've heard mentioned by others, is to stimulate the market. And so you talked about VFR traffic internally uh, with domestic VFR traffic. I always think of it as, as you know, uh, external. But of course, if you were born in Calgary uh, and then you moved to Toronto, you're going to want to go see your parents or whatever. So you're doing that now in one cabin. So one aircraft as opposed to trying to split out those markets. And maybe you can talk a little bit more to that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there. So, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, low-cost, ultra-low-cost carriers, the business model is around keeping costs as low as possible, fares as low as possible, stimulate new demand. Um, and uh, that absolutely works. WestJet's, WestJet's been doing that for 28 years and will continue to do that. But there are some challenges in, in Canada that you talked about that make that a little more difficult. So the ge geography, the low population density, the absolute size of the market is relatively low. And so the ability to stimulate on that is a bit challenged. You talked about the kind of internal uh, uh, um, migration, if you like, internal migration within Canada, which is what creates the opportunity for VFR travel. Uh, it's interesting, in Canada, the rate of internal migration, so somebody moving from Calgary to Toronto, for example, is only about a quarter of the level that it is in Europe and the United States, which is surprises a lot of people, yeah, and surprises a lot of people. So there's less VFR stimul stimulation opportunity in the, in the country. There is an issue of cost, the cost burden that sits on air travel in, uh, in Canada. In Canada, we have a user pay system, so the entire uh, aviation ecosystem is funded by the by the users by the, the customers of the system and uh, whether it's airport improvement fees or nav canada charges uh, air transportation security charges gst you name it uh, it all adds up and it creates a, a, a base uh, that uh, that airlines have to start from when they do their pricing and that base just makes it more difficult to stimulate because you can't get the fare as low as you might be able to in other jurisdictions so that does have an have an impact you made reference to swoop and kind of the decision that we made to wind swoop and fold swoop back into uh, the WestJet the WestJet uh, operating certificate and that was important for us because we came to the realization that the most effective and efficient way so two things first we recognized in Canada because of all the characteristics we talked about to be successful you have to be able to serve multiple segments of the market ultra price con conscious kind of the core of the market which is looking for value but maybe willing to pay for a little bit in terms of the way of benefits and amenities all the way up to your frequent traveler your premium leisure traveler who's looking for a really elevated experience you have to be able to serve all of those segments of the market to be uh, successful in Canada as an airline and what we recognized was it was inefficient and ineffective for us to try to serve the ultra low cost segment of the market with a standalone operation and we recognized we could do that much more efficiently and much more effectively by serving that segment of the market within our aircraft so we now segment the market within the aircraft is why we have different fare bundles why we have different cabins in our aircraft we have different amenities that come with our loyalty program and so forth and some people are willing to pay for that because they value it. Others are not, and they want the lowest possible fare. And uh, we've been pretty successful in being able to serve all of those segments of the market through our aircraft. The high yield market is obviously, you know, key to uh, <laughs> to the success of a of an airline and to be able to um, be profitable. How are you integrating the business market into your new product offering? Are they responding? Or are they still booking economy? Give us a sense of where you stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's an evolving, it's an evolving space for us. We serve the, the business travel market in a lot of ways. So the first and most important thing is the network and the schedule. So you have to have network density, you have to have schedule frequency to be able to compete for that level of traffic. As I mentioned, we already have the, uh, the strongest network and the, and the most scheduled density in seven of the eight biggest cities in Western Canada. So in the West, we're, we're able to compete really well for the business traveler because we have the network to back it up. Um, and then you layer on the other things. So the onboard product, right? So um, the ability to change and cancel 
uh, a flight if they need to, if the meeting, if a meeting gets changed, someone needs to change their flight, the ability to sit in a premium cabin if they choose to do that. We just introduced last week our extended comfort product uh, to give uh, to give travelers more space at the, at the front of the aircraft, the ability to board first um, and uh, to get their carry-on bag up in the overhead bin, that sort of thing uh, we've introduced. And, and obviously the loyalty program uh, plays into our ability to compete for the business traveler. We have a great loyalty program. We have a lot of enhancements that are coming to WestJet Rewards in, in the next little while. So we feel we're really well positioned to compete for that uh, that type of traveler and all the way through right down to the uh, ultra low cost traveler uh, you know often people say that it lowest cost wins uh, there's some truth to that and the reality is you know before covid we were flying an 85 percent load factor across our network if you do the math on that 85 percent, that meant 15 percent of our seats were empty that was about five million seats a year that we were flying around north america empty it adds up. It sure does. I mean, 5 million seats, that's the equivalent of 20 or 25 737 aircraft just flying around empty all day long. And the reality is the marginal cost for us to sell one of those empty seats is very, very low. And that's why we believe we can compete for the ultra low segment of the market, or low cost segment of the market really effectively, because we actually have the lowest marginal cost to be able to compete in that segment of the market. See, I, I just eat this stuff up. I find it so interesting. Um, okay. Now, let's talk about Sudwing. Uh, airline integration, tour operator not. So there's a lot in there, and I'll, I'll just pass it over to you to explain to our viewers. Yeah, so, uh, okay, maybe just start, start, start at a high level. So we acquired... Um, portions of the Sunwing business last year. Uh, we acquired the airlines, Sunwing Airlines, and Sunwing Vacations, the tour operator. We did not acquire the receptive tour operator or the uh, the hotel uh, part of the business. So we have acquired those two business units, and we have different integration paths for the two of them. So the first is on the airline side. We will integrate Sunwing Airlines, which has currently 18 aircraft. We will integrate those 18 aircraft into the WestJet AOC. So we will have a single airline operation, and ultimately Sunwing branded aircraft will go away, and everything will be branded as WestJet, operated by a single uh, a single entity, a single group of pilots, flight attendants, and so forth. So that's on the airline side. We're working through that right now, and that, that airline integration is going to come first. The second piece is the tour operator integration, and that's going to be a little bit different. So we now have a holding company for the tour operator business that covers Sunwing Vacations, WestJet Vacations, and a few other brands that, that came over with the Sunwing family. Um, and that will, that will con we will continue to operate those uh, vacation brands, the tour operator brands, distinctly and independently. So we will have um, WestJet Vacations persisting as a brand in the market. We will have Sunwing Vacations persisting as a brand in the market because those two brands, they serve different segments of the market. They both have uh, quite a bit of value in the market, and we want to continue to uh, to offer those going forward. They also have slightly different business models, which we'll also maintain going forward. Yeah. And you mentioned that one of the reasons you're going to maintain Sunwing as a separate tour operator is the brand equity that the company has, because, of course, it's very recognizable. It's known, so you may as well leverage that, right, and keep it in the market. Exactly. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, no doubt there are operational issues that are going to be affecting all of this, and I don't even want to think about how complicated all of that will be, but no doubt you have some very smart brains at WestJet that will work that out. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And even though the brands will remain uh, visible in the market, we're, we are going to do a lot of back-end integration on technology and those sorts of systems because that will uh, just allow us to uh, uh, to make the whole uh, the whole operation more efficient. So that is the intention. But hopefully that part won't be visible to, uh, to our customers and they'll just see the great service they've uh, become accustomed to. Yeah. Lastly, I just want to touch on... Um, your book of orders uh, with Boeing that are being delayed and how much is that impacting the airline and um, are there contingency plans or are they now telling you that they will because they're getting their act together I mean it's it's very challenging to no fault of your own uh, all the airlines across the world are of course dealing with this fallout are you going to look at an Airbus I mean what what are you what are the discussions yeah, so we have a we have a very large order book with uh, with Boeing for Max 10 aircraft, which are going to be a fantastic plane when uh, when they arrive. Those aircraft are not currently certified, so there's a certification process that has to happen with the Max 10, which will take uh, which will take some time and will be delayed based on the issues that you raised that have been kind of uh, plaguing Boeing for a little while here. And it's not just Boeing; we also see there's issues with some Airbus aircraft and engines and so forth that are uh, that are causing challenges in the in the industry. So it's not just WestJet; every Boeing customer is kind of receiving the same 
same message at this point, which is that there will be uh, delays in delivery. Delays, uh, deliveries are not stopping, but they, they are being delayed. And so we're, we're working through contingency plans for that. Uh, thankfully, we have quite a bit of flexibility in our fleet plan. We have the ability to choose, you know, for example, when we retire certain aircraft or whether or not we return leases or defer lease returns and keep aircraft in the fleet longer. Uh, we are always looking for, for other opportunities to acquire aircraft from, from different lessors as well. So uh, I'm very confident in our ability to continue to secure the aircraft that we need to meet our growth, our growth plan. And of course, we look forward to taking the uh, MAX 10 deliveries when they're ready. Since I have this wonderful opportunity to talk with you directly, this is um, a great chance for you potentially to give a message to the advisors out there. What would you like to say to them? Well, I think the first thing I'd like to say, and we, we kind of reiterated this message over the course of the last few days, you know, for WestJet, working with the, the trade, working with our indirect channels and our indirect partners is very, very important. Uh, you guys are a huge part of our business. We recognize there's a great segment of the market that uh, we can't access on our own. We need to work and partner with all of you to do. We very, very much appreciate the support. And we know we succeed when you succeed and vice versa. And we want to continue that mindset going forward because uh, the trade and these advisors will be a, a big part of our business for the years to come. Thank you so much, John. I'm sure the agents appreciate uh, your messaging, as I have appreciated everything you've um, put out for us to digest. A lot of information, and uh, the honesty and transparency has been refreshing. Thank you. Thanks, Dina.